Hey, are you new to this channel or just haven't subscribed yet? Because you can subscribe today, click the notification bell, then all. You can also like these videos and share the links to them with friends. Because why wouldn't you want to talk to friends about links? Say, hey, this is a cool link. Look at this link. Look at the way the end of the link is. Look at the beginning of the link. This is a pretty cool link. Okay, let's get to this. Have you ever heard a Protestant talking about being born again? I'm going to be discussing 10 facts of being born again. Chances are, if you're a Christian, you believe that you are born again. The next time someone asks you if you've been born again, you can say, not yet. What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be a born again? You'd better be born again. This idea of being born again. Being born again. Jesus called that being born again. Yeah, the phrase born again tends to come up a lot among Protestants, and some of them even wear it as a badge, like, oh yes, yeah, I'm born again. And this isn't just me poking fun, even Protestants today recognize that certain Protestants go a little over the top of this. Born again. This is a very christian -y phrase that if you've grown up in church, no doubt you've heard it a lot. Have you died to yourself and been born again into new life in Christ Jesus, your Redeemer? We've got that expression, born again, born again, born again, and people are getting a little bit tired of it. Because people are saying, I'm a born again Christian, or he's a born again Christian. I'm not so sure, but what it hasn't become a a phrase that really doesn't mean what we really mean biblically about being born again. Born again, it sort of conjures up all kinds of different images. Maybe for you it brings up images of like old time tent revivals with a, with a preacher, you know, in a suit yelling at people who are listening. Or, or maybe a, of TV preachers who are waving their big Bibles in the air and pounding on the pulpits and saying, you must be born again! Now one thing that you'll never see a Protestant or anyone do is show you where the Bible defines specifically how to be born again. And that's simply because the Bible never comes right out and says, hey, here's how to be born again. So it's time for Bible Me, where we show you useful passages from the Bible for answering common questions in Christianity. Today's question is, what does the Bible say about being born again slash born from above? Now the reason we say born again slash born from above is because those are the two possible English translations for the phrase that is used in the Bible. Both phrases refer to the exact same thing. So like this creature here, do you know what this is? By the way, if you do, pause the video. Let me know your name for it in the comments below. And I say that because this thing has multiple different names. Some people call this a mayfly. Some people call it a Canadian soldier. Either one is right. You can use either of these labels for this bug. Likewise, you could say born again or born from above, and they both refer to the same thing. So your Bible might say born again or born from above. We're talking about the same thing. I'll be using them interchangeably in this video so I don't have to continually say born again slash born from above. Now the phrase born again appears in two chapters of the entire Bible. The first place we're going to see it is John chapter 3. It says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, so that's one mention, and Jesus is saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we're going to make a note here. Being born again is necessary for seeing the kingdom of God. Now this doesn't explain how to be born again, it just lets us know that if you are born again, then you can see the kingdom of God. And another thing to note here is that Jesus did not say you will see the kingdom of God if you're born again. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So from what this verse is saying, it's still entirely possible to be born again and never see the kingdom of God. It's saying that you need to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, but it's not saying if you are born again, you're definitely going to see the kingdom of God. I point this out because there are some Protestants who will read that verse and say, hey, look, if I'm born again, then I'm going to see the kingdom of God. That's not what the verse says. It says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is not making any guarantee that born again people are going to see the kingdom of God. It's just saying you can if you're born again. It'd be like saying unless one has a ticket, he cannot board the plane. That means that people without tickets can't board the plane. People with tickets can, but at no point is that saying that if you have a ticket, you're gonna board the plane. You can miss the plane. You need the ticket to board the plane, but having the ticket doesn't automatically mean you've boarded the plane. It just means that you can board the plane. Likewise, all this is saying is that when you're born again, you can see the kingdom of God. But this verse is not guaranteeing that born again people will definitely see the kingdom of God. So back to the passage, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus is questioning this idea of being born again. He asked, How can a man be born when he is old? 
Nicodemus thinks Jesus means actually being born like a natural birth. He even asks Jesus specifically, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And kids, this is why it's important to ask questions. Because if Nicodemus was just like, you know, I kind of think I know what he's talking about. I feel weird asking questions, so I'm just going to go with my gut on this one. And then he just went home. He's like, hey, mom, open wide. I'm going in. That could be weird for all parties involved. So it's a good thing that Nicodemus asked for clarification. And when he did, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus first says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus questions that statement, to which Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. These are very close to being the same statement, but they have two noticeable differences. First, one says again, while the other says of water and the Spirit. And second, one says see, while the other says enter. We'll start with that second change, see and enter. Now, obviously, seeing something and entering something are different things. For instance, I can easily see the White House, but it's not as easy for me to enter the White House. Or I can see a crater on the moon, but it's a lot harder for me to enter a crater on the moon. So seeing and entering are obviously not the same thing. And actually, Jesus told a story about a guy who can see a place, but he could not enter that place. The Bible records this story in Luke's Gospel. It says there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. So the rich man here could clearly see a place that he could not enter. Jesus said that the rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So the rich man could see that, but Abraham tells him, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. So the rich man can see a place here, but he can't enter that place. So being able to see a place does not guarantee that you can enter that place. So why do we go over that? Because so far, the Bible only specifically states that being born again allows you to see the kingdom of God. In order to enter the kingdom of God, the Bible states that you need to have been born of water and the Spirit. So the question becomes, are we allowed to use the phrase born again interchangeably with born of water and the Spirit? The Bible never comes right out and tells us that. So there are at least four possible interpretations that a person can get from this passage. One, born again is not the same thing as born of water and the Spirit. Two, born again is the same thing as born of water and the Spirit. Three, born of water and the Spirit refers to two different births, one where you are born of water and the other where you are born of the Spirit. And born again is the same thing as born of water. And four, born of water and the Spirit refers to two different births, one where you are born of water and the other where you are born of the Spirit. And born again is the same thing as born of the Spirit. Now, obviously, there are more possible interpretations, but we're only going to list these four because that's all we need to make our point. Now, this first interpretation here and this third interpretation, nobody actually uses those, so we're going to cross those out. They are still possible interpretations, but no Christian actually uses those possible interpretations, so we don't need them in this video. I've never heard any Christian argue otherwise. If there is somebody out there like that, let us know in the comments and state your case. These two interpretations that are left here are the ones that people actually use. Now, what they both have in common is that they allow you to link entering the kingdom of God with being born again. Because both are saying that born again is represented in the phrase born of water in the spirit. So if you believe that born again is the same thing as born of water in the spirit, then you can use those phrases interchangeably, which means that truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God can also be read as truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Likewise, if you believe that born of water in the spirit refers to two different births, one where you are born of water and the other where you are born of the spirit, and born again is the same thing as born of the spirit, then you can use the phrase of the spirit interchangeably with the word again, which means truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, can also be read as truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the point is, whichever of these two interpretations you go with, you can still say that being born again allows you to enter the kingdom of God. 
but we're going to add that to the notes being born again is necessary for entering the kingdom of God. Now again, this doesn't explain how to be born again. It just lets us know that if you are born again, then you can enter the kingdom of God. And just like before, Jesus did not say you will enter the kingdom of God if you're born again. He's just saying unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it's a possibility that if you're born again, you can enter the kingdom of God, but this verse is not saying it's a sure thing that you will. You can, but you might not. Now before we go on, there's a Protestant by the name of John Jorgensen, and he points out the same thing that we pointed out in this video, which is that there are many possible interpretations of born of water and the Spirit. What exactly is Jesus talking about here? What does it mean to be born again? And what in the world is Jesus saying when he talks about being born of water and of spirit? Well, that last question of what does it mean to be born of water is actually pretty complicated. It depends on who you ask. There are some scholars who will tell you that Jesus is referring to baptism here. Others believe that when talking about water, Jesus was referring to our human, our physical birth. And then spirit refers to the born again, new life that is found in him. And still, there are others that would tell you that when he says water, Jesus is referring to himself. Or that Jesus is referring to the living water of the Holy Spirit. And so water and spirit in this passage are one in the same. Really what I'm trying to get you to see is that there are many things that born of water and born of spirit could mean. We're going to listen more from John later. I just wanted to show you that even Protestants agree that the Bible does not let us know which of these interpretations we should use. And Jesus goes on to say that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So we can note that as well, Jesus contrasts being born of spirit with the flesh. And if you'd like to learn more about the terms spirit and flesh as they are used in the Bible, we have a video discussing those terms. It is linked in the description and it's also up here in the card. But for this video, you just need to know that Jesus contrasted being born again with the flesh. Jesus continues, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. So again, we're not being given any information here on how to be born again. Jesus told them not to marvel that he said to them, you must be born again. But that doesn't explain how to be born again, only that people need to be born again, and that they should not marvel at the fact that Jesus said this. Jesus does explain that the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And he follows that up by saying, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So that explains a characteristic of people who are born of the Spirit, but it still doesn't tell us how to be born of the Spirit. And you can't just assume that anyone with this characteristic is born again. Because if I told you all peaches are fuzzy, then fuzzy is a characteristic of peaches. But just because something is fuzzy, that doesn't automatically make it a peach. So like this guy here, he's fuzzy. His name is literally fuzz. And wow, his date of birth, guess what day? Today is August 20th, July 23rd. So not even close, but how weird would that have been if I just happened to look at that on the same day as his birthday? But yeah, he's fuzzy, but not a peach. So fuzzy is a characteristic of peaches, but not everything that's fuzzy is a peach. Likewise, this is a characteristic of people who are born of the Spirit, but just because you're this doesn't mean that you're necessarily born of the Spirit. It could also mean that you're wind. So fuzz and peaches share this characteristic, and other things can share that characteristic as well. Likewise, people who are born of the Spirit, the wind, and other things as well can share this characteristic. So that is John chapter 3, and there's no instructions in there on how to be born again. So let's go to the only other chapter in the Bible where born again is mentioned and see if we get any instructions there. It's 1 Peter 1, and Peter tells his audience, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So what do we learn about being born again there? God caused these people to be born again. So add that to the notes. God can cause this to happen. Now some people might say, well, if God causes it to happen, then I don't even need to know how to get born again because God's going to cause it. When God wants it to happen, it'll happen. He'll cause it and we're good. No, that's not necessarily the case. Just because X causes Y, that doesn't mean that Z does nothing to accomplish Y. So in this case, just because God causes people to be born again, that doesn't mean that you do nothing to accomplish being born again. For instance, let's talk about Back to the Future 2. This is a very thick DVD. In Back to the Future Part 2, Biff the bad guy and Marty the good guy are on top of a building. Marty jumps off that building. Now the reason why Marty jumped off that building was because Biff was threatening to shoot him. 
So it was either get shot or jump off the building. So since Biff was threatening him, it could be said that Biff caused Marty to leave the rooftop. But from that statement, can you say, well, Biff caused Marty to leave the rooftop, so I guess Marty didn't have to do anything. Biff caused it to happen. It happened. No. Marty did do something. Marty jumped off the roof. Biff caused Marty to leave the rooftop. Biff was the driving factor. But Marty still did his part of actually jumping off the rooftop. So if X equals Biff, and Y equals Marty to leave the rooftop, and Z equals Marty, you can say that X caused Y, but you can't say that since X caused Y, Z did nothing to accomplish Y. So yes, God caused these people to be born again. But that doesn't mean that these people didn't need to do anything in order to be born again. We know that God caused it to happen, but we don't know much more from that. It could be that God caused it to happen and God took care of everything, so these people didn't have to do anything. But it could also be that God caused it to happen, and the people also had to do their part to actually be born again. The point is we don't have enough information here to know what, if anything, a person needs to do in order to be born again. So aside from knowing that God causes it to happen, this gets us no closer to knowing how to be born again. So let's go to the last usage of born again in the Bible. It's in the same chapter, just a few paragraphs later. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So here Peter is telling his audience that they have been born again. Once more, this doesn't tell us how to be born again. It just tells us that they have been born again. He does explain that they were born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, but that doesn't tell us how to be born again either. It would be like me saying Dottie made an origami not of blue paper, but of red. That doesn't teach us the specifics of how to make this origami that Dottie made. It just explains what the origami was of. So being born again is of imperishable seed. The origami is of red paper. But how are either of those things done? We're not told here. So that's it. That's every use of the term born again that the Bible has to offer. And at no point are we ever told, hey, this is how to be born again, and then given instructions on how to do that. So what does that mean? It means that unless you have a source in addition to the Bible, then you cannot possibly know how to be born again. And while that's not a problem for Christians who aren't Protestant, that is a huge problem for Christians who are Protestant. Because Protestants think that the Bible is the only infallible source of Christian information. They can go to other sources for Christian information, but they can't trust them to have the correct answer because they think that the Bible is the only infallible source of Christian information. It is a false, man-made, and anti-Christian belief called Sola Scriptura. We have a bunch of videos that go over that teaching. They are linked in the description below. Again, it's a false teaching. It's an anti-Christian teaching, but Protestants do believe in it, and at least in situations like this one that we're going to see John Jorgens in it. What exactly is Jesus talking about here? What does it mean to be born again. And what in the world is Jesus saying when he talks about being born of water and of spirit? Well, that last question of what does it mean to be born of water is actually pretty complicated. It depends on who you ask. Really, what I'm trying to get you to see is that there are many things that born of water and born of spirit could mean. And that's really what Nicodemus is left wondering. But I think the mistake that both we and Nicodemus make is we think about this command of being born again simply in physical terms. We obsess over what action do I need to take or what words do I need to say or need to pray in order to check off the born again box. But, and again, this is just my interpretation, I personally believe if there was a right answer or specific physical something that needed to be done, Jesus would have been a lot more clear in his answer. Instead though, Jesus is a bit more vague, and this leads me to believe that being born again isn't so much about a precise physical action as much as it's about a decision and posture that we take in our hearts. Now what I like about John Jorgensen, aside from the alliteration, is that in this video, he's not doing what most Protestants do. In other words, John is being honest with his audience. John is actually telling people that he's giving his opinion here. This is just my interpretation. And he's letting them know he's not stating things that are facts. Seriously, John, that's awesome. We look at a lot of Protestants on this channel. Usually they're just spouting out their opinion as if it's a fact. 
So it's really nice to see a Protestant being honest about this. Now, the trouble that John is in shows off one of the several flaws of Sola Scriptura. One huge problem with Sola Scriptura is that when you see the Bible as your sole infallible source of Christian information, like that's your only infallible source of Christian information, you can't know anything about Christianity because the Bible doesn't tell you how to interpret what's in the Bible. So as John pointed out earlier, the meaning of Jesus' words here in John 3 will change depending on who you ask. It depends on who you ask. So since there are so many possible interpretations of the Bible, and Protestants do not believe that they have any other source that they can go to for infallible information other than the Bible, they arrive at where John is now. They've got a bunch of interpretations and nothing to say, here's the one to go with. So what are John and the Protestants left to do? Guess. That's all they can do. What exactly is Jesus talking about here? What does it mean to be born again? And this is just my interpretation. I personally believe if there was a right answer or specific physical something that needed to be done, Jesus would have been a lot more clear in his answer. I cannot stress this enough. What John Jorgensen's doing here is great. I love seeing a Protestant being honest. He's letting people know there are a bunch of different interpretations of John 3. There are many things that born of water and born of spirit could mean. It depends on who you ask. And since he has nowhere to go to learn about Christianity because the Bible isn't going to tell him which interpretation to pick, John tells us that this is just his personal belief. I personally believe this is his interpretation. This is just my interpretation. This is what John thinks. But I think the mistake, this leads me to believe that, and no joke, this is seriously great to hear from a Protestant. Because again, we're used to hearing from these folks, and they state their personal opinions as if they're facts. And it's ridiculous. You can check out our playlist with them, it's linked in the description below. Now John Jorgensen, if you're watching, I'd recommend you check out this video on the authorities in Christ Church. You can follow along in your Bible. This will help you realize that there's more than just the Bible that can give you infallible information about Christianity. Because we Christians don't have to guess as to what born again means. Jesus set up a system to get information from God to his followers, and it was not a system that limited Christians to just the Bible. So definitely check that video out. It is linked below, also up here in the card. Now again, John is taking a guess as to what he thinks being born again means, but let's listen. This is just my interpretation. I personally believe if there was a right answer or specific physical something that needed to be done, Jesus would have been a lot more clear in his answer. Instead though, Jesus is a bit more vague. And this leads me to believe that being born again isn't so much about a precise physical action as much as it's about a decision and posture that we take in our hearts. All right, so a couple things I wanna point out there. John just said that Jesus is vague. And John is saying that this vagueness has led him to believe in this theory that John has come up with. First of all, and with all due respect to John, this doesn't make any sense. Like this whole process here, that's not something I think John would do in any similar situation. Because let's say your mom, who loves you very much, and would not under any circumstance wants you to spontaneously combust, wrote a book called How to Not Spontaneously Combust Tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Now you open that book, and it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is capulton aborted, they will spontaneously combust tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. And that's all the book said on the topic. It never comes out and explicitly defines how to be capulton aborted. It does say that your mom causes it to happen, but there's no instructions on how to be capulton aborted. Would you have the same attitude about being capulton aborted as John Jorgensen did about being born again? Would you be like, psh, mom was super vague on this one, but she cares about me, so I guess that capulton aborting isn't really so much a precise physical action that I need to do, as much as it is a decision and a posture that I need to take in my heart. No, nobody in their right mind would respond that way. You'd be calling up your mom like, hey mom, what the heck is Capulton blurking? I need to learn it and I need to learn fast. Dad? Oh, yeah, can you put mom on the phone? Yeah, it's terrible that they're getting into the corn this year, but I, I really need to talk to mom. No, I, I don't know how to get rid of the squirrels, dad. I, I need to talk to mom right now. Okay, well, if you hear a bang at 7.30 tomorrow, this is on you. Here's the thing. Jesus is literally teaching that you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you have been born of water and the Spirit. He's saying you cannot enter unless this other thing happens. That's a big deal for Christians. We would like to enter the kingdom of God, just like people would like to not spontaneously combust tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. So these are big issues here. If you're feeling like Jesus or your mom were vague on these topics, then you don't just guess. But that's what John Jorgensen is doing here. He's saying, well, Jesus was vague, so I guess that means that it's not something we do physically. 
What? This is just my interpretation. I personally believe if there was a right answer or specific physical something that needed to be done, Jesus would have been a lot more clear in his answer. Since when does vagueness mean you don't have to do something physically? That's not a thing. And John, the other problem with what you're saying there is that you're hinging your hunch on an assumption. You see, the whole reason for John's hunch is his belief that Jesus was being vague. Jesus is a bit more vague, and this leads me to believe that- But was Jesus actually vague on the topic? John Jorgensen can't possibly know that. What John actually believes is that the Bible is vague on the topic, not Jesus. When Jesus taught about being born again, he might not have been vague at all. He could have gone on for days about being born again and going into the specifics of it, how it works, what's going on there. John Jorgensen doesn't know if that was the case, neither do I. But even the Bible says there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Also, the Bible records this quote that Jesus said to his apostles. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So while John might find the Bible to be vague on the topic of being born again, that doesn't mean that Jesus was vague on the topic. Again, Jesus could have talked for days, but this is all we see in the Bible. And that's a good thing to remember. Not everything Jesus ever taught is written down in the Bible. A lot of Jesus' teachings were passed down by word of mouth, so it's entirely possible that Jesus wasn't vague on the topic of being born again at all. It's entirely possible that much more information about being born again was shared by Jesus, and it just didn't get written down in the writings that we later put into the Bible. And it's also entirely possible that when the author of this passage wrote about being born again, he didn't think he needed to explain too much about how to be born again, because maybe his audience already knew how to be born again, because of word of mouth teachings. So that's already two huge problems with John Jorgensen's theory here. One, it's built off the assumption that Jesus was vague, which John can't prove at all. And two, even if Jesus were vague, John makes a gigantic leap from there when he says, well, Jesus was vague, so it must not be something I need to do. The third problem with John Jorgensen's theory, though, is that it refutes itself. Because first he says it's not something we do. To be born again isn't really about saying the right words or making the right gesture or praying the right prayer. Being born again isn't so much about a precise physical action. But then he explains, and it is something we do. As much as it's about a decision and posture that we take in our hearts. If you have a decision or a posture that you have taken in your heart, that's something you're doing. The difference between a born again person and a non-born again person, in John Jorgensen's opinion, is that the born again person did stuff. They did works and they got born again. We are born again when we make the decision to die to the old life we had and be born again into a new way of living. Being born again is saying yes to a clean slate, to a fresh start, to a new life where Jesus is Lord and King of my life, and I am dedicated to following him. So John was saying that he doesn't think that being born again involves any type of work on our part, but then he goes on to explain that being born again involves work on our part. Being born again isn't so much about a precise physical action. He is saying it's not a physical work, like a work that you can visibly see, but it's still a work. John is saying that we make a decision. We are born again when we make the decision to die to the old life we had. Making a decision is still a work. It's something we do. Being born again isn't so much about a precise physical action as much as it's about a decision and posture that we take in our hearts. Taking a certain posture in your heart, that's a work, that's something you do. To be born again isn't really about saying the right words. Being born again is saying yes to a clean slate, to a fresh start, to a new life. Now this might seem weird that John Jorgensen is refuting himself like this, but it's actually a situation that Protestants get themselves into all the time. For instance, this is a Protestant named Robert Breaker. Jesus says you must be born again. Why must you be born again? Well, this is talking about salvation. Being born again is being saved. Because if you're not saved, where do you end up? Those who aren't saved will end up in hell for all eternity. And the only way to get out of hell is through being born again. Okay, so Robert says that being born again is being saved. He continues. Salvation, according to the Bible, the way to be born again is by believing. I hope that shows up and I didn't write that too high. So he's saying that in order to be born again or saved, you have to do something. You have to believe. That's the way to be born again, 
according to Robert Breaker. But then he says this. You're not saved by works. You cannot get to heaven based upon what you do. So according to Robert Breaker, you can't get saved by what you do, but you can get saved by believing, which is something that you do. It makes no sense. And actually, listen to the full clip from Robert. You're not saved by works. You cannot get to heaven based upon what you do. The only way to heaven is based upon what you do with what Jesus did for you. So according to the Protestant Robert Breaker, you cannot get to heaven based upon what you do. The only way to heaven is based upon what you do with what Jesus did for you. That still means the only way to heaven is based upon what you do. So these two things conflict with each other. You're not saved by works. You cannot get to heaven based upon what you do. The only way to heaven is based upon what you do. You can't have it both ways. The reason why Robert and John are refuting themselves is because they have a teaching called faith alone. So we're going to look at salvation today. And today it is indeed by faith alone. Not only is faith our only means of justification, justification by works is impossible. No one can be justified by their works. We already have Bible studies showing why faith alone is a false teaching. It's an anti-Christian teaching. It's an anti-biblical teaching. So check those out. They are linked below in the description. But yeah, as Protestants, they're trying to protect that teaching, but also try to make sense out of born again, which sounds like it's something you need to do. But back to John. Earlier, we heard John say this. What does it mean to be born again? And what in the world is Jesus saying when he talks about being born of water and of spirit. There are some scholars who will tell you that Jesus is referring to baptism here. But of course, then that leads us into the whole, do I need to be baptized in order to be saved? Dangerous territory. So John is saying that this is dangerous territory, but why is John saying that? Actually, why is Richard Breaker saying this type of thing too? I talked to a woman one time and asked her, hey, are you born again? And she said, of course I am. And we started talking, and I thought, well, she might be a Christian. Let me ask her a testimony. And she says, yeah, I was born again when I was baptized in the Catholic Church. So the Catholics take this term born again, and they try to make it into the water. And they baptize a little baby. They say, now he's born again. That's not, not what the passage is talking about. Why are these Protestants not cool with the idea of this passage talking about baptism? I mean, the Bible never says that being born again is not the same thing as being baptized, so why are they ruling that particular interpretation out? It seems kind of strange that both of these Protestants are shooting that interpretation down, but neither of them are giving any biblical reason for doing so. You know what? Since they brought it up, let's go ahead and take a peek at what the Bible has to say about baptism. 1 Peter 3 says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So we can read about back in the days of Noah, when eight persons were brought safely through water. In other words, here we have a situation where people were saved through water. And we're told that baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. So the Bible just entered what John Jorgensen called dangerous territory. Do I need to be baptized in order to be saved? Dangerous territory. The Bible literally says that baptism now saves you. We're even told how it saves you. It says baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So the action of baptism, the removal of dirt from the body, you're not being saved because of just that action. It's this intention behind the action, this appeal to God for a good conscience. That's what saves you. So if an atheist were to do the physical actions of a baptism and they were just doing it as a joke and they didn't have this appeal to God for a good conscience, then that action alone is not going to save them. But when you do that physical work of baptism with the work of making an appeal to God for a good conscience, then that does save you. It's like how Jesus said, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Is this action of looking at a woman bad? No, looking at a woman isn't a sin. But if your intent is lustful, then that's not good. So this action by itself doesn't save you. But when you have the action and the correct intent, baptism does save you. So back to our notes on being born again. We know that being born again allows you to see and enter the kingdom of God. Now the Bible never tells us that born again people will definitely see and enter the kingdom of God. We're only told that they can see and enter the kingdom of God. But Christians who are Protestants and Christians who are not Protestants would still say that being born again saves you. I think that's a fair statement. Being born again saves you from not being able to see and enter the kingdom of God. So being born again is similar to baptism in that they both save you. 
wonder what else they have in common. Let's find out. When Nicodemus got confused by the phrase born again, Jesus swapped out the word again with of water and the spirit. So being born of water and the spirit, what could that mean? I mean, we got born there, so that's like a type of birth. We've got water and we've got the spirit. Well, we know baptism involves water. We just read about how baptism corresponds to the eight persons who are brought safely through water. Plus there's a bunch of baptism accounts in the Bible and they involve water. So how about this spirit? Does that have anything to do with baptism? Well, if we go back just two chapters before Jesus said this thing about being born of water and the spirit, we learn that Jesus is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So with baptism, there's water and there's the spirit. What an interesting coincidence. How about this birth aspect though? Does baptism check that off too? Let's find out. Paul said to the Romans, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So with baptism, there seems to come a newness of life. A newness of life definitely gives off some vibes of being born a second time, dare I say, being born again, but let's not jump the gun here. So Paul is talking about being baptized into Christ. I wonder what that means, baptized into Christ. What's it mean to be in Christ? Well, Paul says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Well, okay, so when you're baptized, you can be baptized into Christ. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. So you go from being an old creation to a new creation. You were an old creation, but that passed away, and then you're a new creation. So you were created once, and then, then you were created again. Another way of summarizing that would be getting born again. So yeah, baptism is a type of rebirth involving water and the spirit, and it saves us. This is intriguing. Wait a second. All this is from God? So you're baptized into Christ, and if you're in Christ, then you're a new creation. You've been created again, and all this is from God. That's funny, because we know that being born again was caused by God. And here we are learning that the effect of baptism is from God. So God causes the effects of baptism to be possible. God causes us to be able to become a new creation in Christ. So now I'm thinking two things. Either born again and baptism are the same thing, or baptism is how you get born again. Because born again just refers to the effect that baptism has. Now hang on. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer? Wasn't being born again contrasted with being according to the flesh too? Why do these two things have so much in common? Actually, wait a second, this is crucial, because Jesus said you must be born again. Did Jesus ever say that about baptism? We should probably check. So Jesus told the eleven, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's from Mark's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, we can read that Jesus said to his eleven disciples in Galilee, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. So Jesus just gave the eleven disciples three commands. One, make disciples of all nations. Two, baptize the disciples that they make. And three, teach these new disciples to observe all that Jesus has commanded them. And what was it that Jesus just commanded them to do? Jesus commanded them to make disciples of all nations, baptize the disciples that they make, and teach these new disciples to observe all that he has commanded them. So since the eleven were commanded to baptize new disciples, and they were commanded to teach these disciples to observe all that Jesus commanded to the eleven, then all disciples should be observing the command to baptize new disciples. Which means that if you are a follower of Christ, then you must be baptized. Christ didn't say teach them to observe it if they wanted to, he said teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. So if every follower of Christ observes the commands that Christ wants us to observe, then every follower of Christ has to be baptized. That's the logical conclusion to what Jesus taught here. If Christians mess that up, that's not Jesus' problem, that's our problem. Jesus set up a system here, and if this system is followed perfectly, then every Christian must be baptized, just like they must be born again. So let's recap. We know that Jesus left his apostles with commands that result in all disciples being baptized. So you must be baptized. Jesus also flat out stated you must be born again. We also know that Jesus swapped out the phrase born again with the words born of water and the spirit, and we learn that baptism is also a type of rebirth involving water and the spirit. In other words, you're being born of water and the spirit. God caused people to be born again, 
And the rebirth that comes with baptism is from God. Being born again is contrasted with the flesh, and being baptized is contrasted with the flesh. We know from the Bible that baptism saves you, and we can also say that being born again saves you because it saves you from not being able to see or enter the kingdom of God. So everyone watching, if you could please help me out here, let me know in the comments. Do you think that being born again and being baptized are two entirely different things, both of which are required, both of which involve the same elements, both of which allow us to be metaphorically reborn, both of which have that rebirth caused by God, both of which share a similar contrast, and both of which yield the same results? In other words, does anyone think that these two incredibly similar things, being born again and baptized, are actually different? Because if you do think that, do you think they're totally different things? I have no problem with you thinking that. But here's the thing. That would mean that all Christians need to be both born again and baptized in order to follow Christ. Oh, and keep in mind that if being born again is not the same thing as baptism, or at least a result of baptism, then the Bible still has no clear instructions on how to be born again. So, good luck guessing. This is just my interpretation. I mean, if you get it wrong, then you can't see or enter the kingdom of God. But yeah, good luck guessing. Seriously though, let me know in the comments, does anyone think that being born again is something completely different from being baptized? Or do you think that being born again is simply a metaphor that Jesus used for baptism? Or maybe the effects of a baptism? So you get baptized and then you're born again because you're baptized into Christ and then you become a new creation. So your baptism results in being born again. Now, if you do happen to think they're two totally different things, then do you also think that born again is better than baptism or are they equal? Because the Bible teaches that they are very similar. If you don't think they're equally important, then why would you hold one higher than the other? Also, if you do think they're different things, can you let us know in the comments how it is that a person gets born again? Because the Bible never spells it out, so I'm just curious what your instructions would be. Now, obviously, I think it makes a lot more sense to say that being born again is just a metaphor that Jesus used to refer to baptism, or at least the effects of baptism. After all, look at the Bible. Peter addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about three thousand souls. So Peter wants them to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He told them to save themselves from this crooked generation. And then they got baptized. Notice how we're not being told anything about them being born again here. That kind of seems odd, right? Because Jesus said, you must be born again. Yet there's no mention of that phrase here. Why didn't Peter say, repent and be born again, every one of you? Could it have been that maybe Peter knew that by being baptized, they would be born again? Because maybe being born again is just what happens with baptism? Seems possible. In Acts 8, we can read that an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch. He was in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. We're then told what the passage of scripture was that they were reading, and the eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? So this is kind of like how John Jorgensen is getting all these different interpretations of the passage. He doesn't know which one to pick. It depends on who you ask. That happens. Right here with the eunuch, he's reading this passage. He doesn't know. Should he interpret this as the prophet talking about himself, or should he interpret this as the prophet talking about someone else? You don't ask the Bible which interpretation you should use. You ask somebody who knows the Bible. So he asked Philip, who the Spirit told to go over and join the chariot. And after he asked Philip that, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Notice how after being told the good news, the eunuch made no delays in being baptized once he got to water. He seems pretty psyched about this baptism thing. He stops the chariot and gets in the water. You know what we don't hear about in this story? The eunuch talking about being born again. He heard the good news about Jesus, but we're not told anything about him being born again here? I mean, just because it's not written here doesn't mean it didn't happen, but we are told about his baptism. Or maybe we are told about him being born again because when he was baptized, he was born again. Now in Acts 10, Peter was talking, and the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Ooh, business idea for anyone watching whose name is Jennifer. Start a flooring company, 
call it Gentiles. Give me a discount because I helped you with the name. So yeah, people were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Hey, how about that? Peter's commanding people to be baptized. That makes sense because Jesus commanded them to baptize the disciples and to have those disciples observe the command for baptism. Anyway, are you noticing a pattern here? New believers are being baptized. There is water and there is a spirit. In this case, the spirit fell on people. Peter realizes this and he's like, oh, hey, I know this recipe. Just add water. He declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you actually read the Bible, it seems pretty clear that being born again is just a metaphor that Jesus used to describe baptism or the effects of baptism. Paul and Silas were in prison. They were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Those are some lucky prisoners. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself dark. He was about to kill himself because he was supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself, for we are all here. It's cool. Don't have to kill yourself now. That was a bad idea to begin with, but we're still here, so just don't do it. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So just remembering back now, we know that being born again saves you, and baptism saves you. The jailer just asked, what must I do to be saved? Which of those two things do you think happened next? He said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So the jailer wanted to know what must they do to be saved and they said believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household and then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house now what do we know from earlier was one specific part of the word of the Lord Jesus commanded baptism and he commanded that new disciples be taught to observe baptism so they said to him believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved if you believe in the Lord Jesus then you're gonna believe in this stuff that Jesus said you're going to believe in his command for baptism the jailer was baptized at once, he and his family. And guess what? He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. If you believe in God, you're going to follow his command to be baptized. Continuing on, Paul told the Ephesians, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Being born again and being baptized seem to have a lot in common. Why would Paul talk about one baptism and neglect to mention one born againing? Could it possibly be that being born again is covered by saying baptism? Because maybe being born again is a result of your baptism or just a metaphor for baptism? And now for the best part, the part that is just staring us right in the face, let's go back to John chapter 3. This is where Jesus talked about being born again, being born of water and the Spirit. And Jesus says, you must be born again. If we keep on reading, it says that after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. Now I might be asking a stupid question here, so if you think I am, please let me know, but seeing as Jesus just got done explaining how important being born again was, I mean he even said you must be born again, then why the heck is it that after that Jesus and his disciples are spending their time baptizing people instead of born againing people? Unless of course being baptized would cause these people to be born again. Yeah, these two things definitely seem like the same exact thing, or being born again is the result of baptism. So yeah, John Jorgensen, if you're watching, this is not dangerous territory. 
This is Biblical Territory. We have a Bible study on baptism. You can check that out. The link is in the description. Also up here in the card. I hope people found this video useful. Thank you all for watching. This is Bible Me. You've been Bible. Please let me know in the comments what you think. Are baptism and born again the same thing? Or at least very closely linked as in being born again is a result of being baptized. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell. Then all like the video and share it with friends. Thank you for doing that. That's a huge help to the channel. This is How to Be Christian. You all have a great day. Oh, wait. Forgot I had to make a call. Hey, Capold and the Blurkin, what's the deal?